me, I have a couple of really cool people, like I said. So I have Anoma, I have Sumisola Akirili, and I also have Blessing Adesiji. So this lineup on its own, you can already tell that it's going to be really amazing. I'm going to be telling you a little bit about these people, what they do, how they do it, and why exactly they are going to be our, you know, major speakers on this webinar. Why did we choose them to come and talk to you guys? So you're going to figure that out in a couple of minutes. Let me start with Anoma. So Anoma is a data analyst with Bloomberg. Uh, just a second, please. So I have to, I have to get the bio. 100% correct this hour because I mean, these are really special people who have taken time out to actually come and talk to us. And I just really want you to understand how amazing these people are. So uh, here we go. So who is Anoma? Anoma is a data analyst with Bloomberg, as I mentioned earlier. She's also the founder of Women in Data women in data Africa, and that's something that you should totally check out. This is a community that's helping African women get into tech. So if you're a young lady, if you're someone who is really, really enthusiastic about you know, data, data analysis, data science, Anoma is definitely somebody that you should be following. In her spare time, she loves to read and volunteer for tech events. Then we have Blessing at DCG. Blessing is, in fact, he's just super amazing. The fact that he was able to take out time to join us for this webinar is just fantastic. I didn't think he was going to be able to make it. He is a senior developer relations engineer for the ENA region at Circle. And he's someone who is very enthusiastic about teaching people, learning, and you know, utilizing large language models for building AI applications at um, yeah, and currently he is guiding developers on creating financial products on blockchain, specifically using stable coins at Circle. Again, if you're someone who is interested in, you know, engineering, developer relations, then that's somebody that you definitely want to be following. Um, during his leisure time, he maintains a very active lifestyle and takes pleasure in football. And the most interesting thing about Blessing here is that he was recently granted a global talent visa by the United Kingdom, where he currently resides. So yes, Blessing is definitely somebody that you might want to connect with. Then finally, we have Sumisola Akirili. Now she's a very amazing human resources professional with over 10 years of experience across insurance, construction, investment banking, and fintech startup space. Now, she's someone who has worked across a lot of verticals and, you know, has, her experience has just made her understand better how well to relate with talent, how to recruit, how you should behave if you're someone that's, you know, actively looking for jobs in the job markets, basically. Now, she is someone who has a bachelor's degree in economics from Achievers University, an MBA in human resources management from Ahmad, Ahmad Bello University, and also a professional member of the Chartered Institute of Personnel Management. Currently, she is the head of people operations at FINCRA. I'm sure a lot of you know FINCRA. If you're in the fintech space, then you definitely know FINCRA. Now, when she's not working, she enjoys traveling, contemporary arts, and music. Now I've introduced all of our guests. I'm going to just, you know, let them say a quick hello before we now get right into the business of today. So you guys, just a quick wave at our audience, just to greet everyone. Thank you very much for that, Anuma. So um, the purpose of this webinar, of course, um, understanding the global talent landscape. As we very well know, a lot of talents are emerging from Nigeria. These days, you see a lot of people working with companies like Bloomberg, maybe Goldman Sachs. You, know, you see a lot of international organizations actually making efforts to come down to Nigeria to actually recruit talents and you know, hire people. You see Nigerian talents who are doing really, really amazing things out there. And then you start to wonder, you know, how are these people getting these jobs? Why are they getting these jobs? Why are these international organizations 
coming to, you know, coming to Nigeria to actually recruit people and what can I do as a talent to key into this. Now, this is why we want to have these conversations. And this conversation is something that's just going to be too multifaceted. Now, on one part, we're going to be talking about it on the side of, you know, you as the talent, you know, what you can do, how you can position yourself to get more international roles, and then talk about it from the HR angle as well. If you're a recruiter who has been taxed with, you know, hiring from different countries, then this is definitely one webinar that you should have your pen and paper beside you. Now, to start with, I'm just going to go right into the very first um, question. Now, um, this question is directed at Blessing. Um, Blessing, are you with us? Uh, yeah, I am. Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? Uh, if you're speaking, I can't hear you. Okay, yeah, can you hear me now? Is it better now? Hello? Oh, awesome. Okay, Hello, so I hear? just wanted to... Yes, I can hear you now. Awesome. So, okay, yes, yeah, my, first... Yeah, yeah. my first question is for you. What are the yes, key please. characteristics of the Nigerian talent pool that makes it in, um, attractive to international organizations? Now, what do you think we have as Nigerian talents? Why are international organizations coming to look for us? And how does it compare to the talent pool in other regions? Just like from your personal point of view. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So to answer your question, one thing I've actually noticed is that the, the uh, industry that in companies are hiring for is a very dynamic industry. And what do I mean by dynamic is that it changes a lot uh, and you are expected to also know a lot to be able to go with the change, stay on top of trending uh, topics and just be dynamic in nature. And one characteristics or one feature that we as Nigerians we have is the ability to be dynamic as well, the ability to learn on our feet, the ability to also cope with different conditions. I don't know if it is how we're raised or if it is the condition or if it is the fact that we know that we don't have things handed to us, we have to work for it, we are hardworking. So it just push us to go that extra mile to be able to learn so many things at the same time and also be dynamic with uh, with the industry. So say for instance, you're a software engineer and you join a startup, right? Your startup is, is, is not a big company. So as a software engineer, you're probably asked to, you probably started as a front-end engineer and then you move very quickly to the back-end role and then you are doing cloud infrastructure. And if there's a data project, you're also leading that as a data scientist, right? So you've done so much in a very, short period and to be able to do that you need to be able to learn on your feet like i said do a lot of things at during that short period and i feel like we nigerians have thrived we've survived and we've done excellently well in that regard because i have so many friends in so many companies that are doing exactly that and they are getting accolades just by the fact that they are being able to be dynamic or being able to to uh to be able to keep to that industry and keep to the trend. So sorry if you're hearing a lot of background noise, like she said, it was really tough for me to join, but that's my contribution. Yeah, thank you very much for that. I, I appreciate your outfit, you know. One thing that I really picked up on is the fact that, you know, talents are actually working extra hard. You know, we're going the extra mile. It's not just, you don't just go into that workspace thinking that, you know, yeah, I'm going there and then whatever this person is doing or whatever somebody from, let's say, the UK or maybe from Ghana is doing, that's the same energy that I'm putting in. So, you know, Nigerians are always going the extra mile. And that's something that I just find interesting because that's, that is the energy they expect from you. That is what they think is going to, you know, happen when they hire you. Now, this is leading up to my second question. Um, I'll expect you to take this, uh, Sumisola. How has the global tech economy evolved, especially now in 2023? And what do you think the unique challenges are when it comes to, you know, that international organizations face when it comes to hiring and managing global talents? Now, I'm not speaking locally right now. I'm talking like on an international scale. All right. Thank you for that question, Eniola. Um, So I think 
we saw a lot of interesting trends in 2023 on a global tech level. First of all, flexible working arrangements came to stay, be it, you know, the remote work culture or organizations that were embracing like the hybrid style. Yeah. We also have the issue of scarcity of tech talent. A lot of us on this call who are talent acquisition specialists or recruiters can attest to that, right? And that is something that has impacted everyone, both at a local and at the global tech market. Um, another interesting thing was that, you know, um, we witnessed a lot of hiring and working across the border or relocating to another country. You know, that became really prevalent. So case in point, Nigeria, right? Nigeria saw that a lot where we had migration of our mid-level experienced talents moving outside Nigeria in quotes, the Japa syndrome, right? So for our non-Nigerian listeners, Japa is our indigenous lingo for relocation. Um, yes. So to look at it from a macroeconomic perspective, similarly, we had concerns from businesses, right, where about 59% of organizations had to revise their 2023 technical hiring plans, right, by freezing new positions because there was a lot of uncertainty, right, at a global market scale. And also the elephant in the room, the infamous tech layoffs, right, by some of the biggest names, like the Googles, the Microsofts, the Amazons of our, of our time. So the statistics I have here from um, layoffs.fyi, you can check it out. The total number of tech layoffs that we have till date stands at about 201,860. That's a lot, right? Yeah. Also, to people who are in the property business space, there was a downward trend in office spaces generally because um, office attendants are right now at about 30%, even below pre-pandemic levels. Yeah, According to the research by Bloomberg, we saw that remote workers reduced office occupancy value by $800 billion. So that's a lot. So the world is going through major shifts. Right. So speaking as a HR professional, from a cultural perspective, employee first mindset has also become really pervasive. Yeah. A lot of um, talents before accepting any offer from you, they are more interested in what the um, culture of your organization looks like and what is that unique. Yes. Yeah. What is that unique employee value proposition that you are bringing to the table? And last but not the least, one of the interesting trends we saw at a global level was applied and generative AI, right? My all-time favorite is chat GPT <laughs> that sort of exposed us and enabled us to access and interact with deep learning model, um, models. So now coming to, um, you know, the challenges that um, HR people face on a global level, I'll say the number one thing here is the very tough competition for top talents, right? We've talked about hiring across borders and right now, talents now have a wider playing field, right? Meaning I can take a job from anywhere in the world as long as I have the requisite skill set, right? That the organization in question is looking for. So that has been one thing that a lot of businesses have had to deal with. Um, also, I would say financial challenges, right? Because when we're saying you're hiring from like a different um, demography, a different location in the world, you need to take into cognizance the financial aspect of it. So whether you're hiring someone who is an actual international expert that is required to resume on-prem at your location, you need to consider costs like logistics, like accommodation, airfare, allowances, things like that, right? So it sort of builds in to the total employment cost. So you can see the financial aspect here. Also, there's market conditions, which has like, you know, which impacts compensation structures depending on where you are. So for instance, if you know, um, you are hiring from a developing company, maybe it's a developing country, maybe somewhere in Europe, of course, because of the exchange rates, the cost of living and things like that. Um, generally, you know that you'll be, look, you'll be playing with higher compensation values, right? In comparison to hiring from like a so, um, Saharan region so, in West Africa. Yeah. Also, there's the issue of payroll, 
right? So when you're paying, thanks to all the, you know, companies that are facilitating cross-border payments and like, like the oh, likes of Fincra, <laughs> like the likes of what Fincra is doing, providing seamless payment solution on a cross-border level, right? So this also impacts, you know, um, the what's it called the financials of a business because you're not looking at i'm having maybe five six employee across different organizations in different countries where they have diff multiple currencies right so exchange rates also play like a very um important part here and that's one of the challenges that businesses and even hr professionals have faced last but not the least i'd like to talk about um you know, the onboarding and team dynamics challenges, you know, beyond just successfully hiring internationally, you need to look at certain nuances, like how the new hire can completely adapt into a new work culture. You know, um, you need to also look at sometimes the issue of language barrier or, you know, even cultural differences, right? So those are some of the things that um, people operations or HR professionals and even businesses that they will have like experienced on that level. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much for that answer. I'm still going to come back to you, you know, just to help me because um, I picked up a lot of things from what you said, but I just really want to quickly touch back to Blessing because he would have to be dropping off really, really soon because he has like a really tight schedule, which I totally understand. So Blessing, just before you leave, now, I understand that you have the, you know, UK Global Talent Visa, and I'm sure a lot of people that joined this session, you know, they just want to know, like, what do they have to do? So it's like a two-pronged question, basically. One, what do they have to do to position themselves in such a way that they can actually get international roles? What advice would you give them? And then for someone who wants to, you know, probably apply sometime later for the Global Talent um, Lisa, what advice would you give them? Just touch base on it in like two to three minutes and that's it. Ah, uh, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. So sorry that I'm actually outside. <laughs> I'm hearing the love background noise. Yeah. So I think uh, because of time, I'm happy to, is it possible that I send like a much detailed answer and then you can share to the attendees maybe via email because I have to leave now. No problem. Okay, okay, thank you. I really do not want to answer really quickly and not cover all the points, but if you send to me via email, I'll just send a detailed answer and uh, attach all the necessary resources that I also wanted to share uh, during this meeting. So I think that would be fine. No problem. So guys, he has already promised thank us some resources. So after the webinar, I'm definitely going to be sharing it with you guys, uh, but let's just quickly jump back in. Anoma, back here with you i just have like really cool questions because again you know how much i love your story you know of someone who went from hr and directly into tech you know into data you know how that has been so now speaking on from the perspective of the talents now what strategies would you say that talents should embody or have in order to position themselves globally and attract top organizations say I'm, I'm not going to specify on the platform now. I mean, there are many platforms where people can find jobs, right? What are they supposed to be doing to ensure that, you know, they get noticed? All right, thank you so much for your question. I think I'll answer from a technical point of view. That's anyone that's interested in getting a tech position, because that's where I have experience with, um, considering that I moved because of work. Uh, so I think first things first, people generally forget to work on their soft skills while they are building their technical skills. So they're spending so much time learning like how to code, learning algorithms, learning different models under machine learning, but they are unable to communicate whatever skills they have, whatever projects they've worked on. And that is very detrimental to organizations recruiting in general. In this side of the world, they don't pay as much, at, they do pay attention, but they don't um, prioritize technical skills over soft skills, 
which was very alarming for so many people. And it was also a culture shock that an organization would tell you that, oh, we can't recruit you at this point because you do not have certain soft skills, even when you have the technical skills to do those jobs. Uh, so many people I see all the time where they have an amazing portfolio, they have an amazing orb of projects that they've worked on, but they do not have great communication skills. They are not even able to communicate and sell themselves in 30 seconds or 30 minutes. They don't have critical thinking skills or problem solving. They don't know how to collaborate or like work in teams. These are super amazing skills everyone should have. Apart from the soft skills, I think we also forget to work on projects as technical talent. I know so many people that come to me and they're like, oh, I've done this course, this course, this course, and that course, but I've not seen any job. I've been applying for jobs, but I've not gotten any callback. What am I doing wrong? And then I noticed that most of the time, they haven't worked on any projects. They haven't built their personal portfolio to show that I can do this thing that I'm applying for. They've only attended classes and done courses, but they don't have a portfolio to show that or to communicate to the recruiter that I am capable enough to do this. And then someone comes with the argument that, oh, I need a job to get that international job. Not really. That's where working on personal projects actually come in. That's where working and building your own personal portfolio actually comes into place. Um, that's like the second thing. And I think the third thing that I did personally was to leverage social media. I know that people most of the time um, pay more attention to the disadvantages of social media. But luckily for me, because I'd say I was very lucky, I was able to find how to leverage social media for my career. I was able to find ways to um, build my personal brand on social media to attract the type of jobs and recruiters that I wanted to attract. Uh, so yeah, for anyone listening, first things first, work on your soft skills. If you don't know how to communicate, if you don't know how to answer basic interview questions, please go and work on them. Um, also work on projects while you are building your technical skills, because that's what will get you into the job to showcase your soft skills and to get the recruiter wanting to recruit you. The last but not the least, leverage social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, like every tech person is on Twitter. If you're not a Twitter and you call yourself a tech person, I don't know. There's Tread now. I don't know how Tread works. Well, like, yeah, maybe yeah, maybe now or something. <laughs> I'm still trying to navigate how Tread works, but for everybody that wants to use social media to grow their careers, check out LinkedIn and Twitter. That's like amazing platforms that can have amazing benefits to your career. I hope I've been able to answer your question. Yes, yes, actually. You actually gave like a lot of answers that I was just thinking about like, yes, soft skills, soft skills. <laughs> so um, regarding to what you said, right? So you said soft skills. Do you mind giving examples of these soft skills? That's one. Then secondly, now you said projects, personal projects, right? But I feel like there are some particular, um, would I say careers that personal projects might seem a bit difficult for them to do, like telling them to go and now create an entire project or build an entire app because they want to have like personal projects. So in a case like that, what should they do? Uh, I'll answer the um, second question first. So before, okay. um, right after I got certified, like when I got my ACIPM um, when I was in school and I really wanted to get a job in HR, uh, because I wanted to practice and like tell myself that, oh, you've practiced. Now you know that you can do tech full time because you've practiced and you know you don't want to do HR. So I really wanted to get a job and I knew that I didn't have work experience and I knew that HR, I can't really build a portfolio or I can't build projects that I've worked on to show that I know what I'm doing or I know what I know what to do on the job. And so what I started doing was to volunteer to NGOs. I did a lot of volunteering work. I volunteered my HR skills to the point where I, <laughs> to the point where, that's one way to go about it. 
Yes, there's so many amazing NGOs. If you have interest in, say, for example, climate change, and you're looking at um, working on your skills or upskilling, that's one way you can build your skills by volunteering your skills to these NGOs. NGOs don't have money technically, so they can't pay you technically. Um, I mean, so some, I know that's why I said technically. So yeah. I have money. <laughs> But well, coming from like a Nigeria's point of view, most NGOs in Nigeria don't actually have that bandwidth to, to pay you the salary that you deserve. So it's a good way for you to volunteer your skills and also upskill them through that process. So that's one thing I did that got me my first job, to be very honest. Like every single volunteering experience that I had culminated into this amazing work experience that I could use to apply for jobs. So that's, that's one way we can all go about it. If, if you know you are unable to build portfolios and work on projects, technical projects, volunteer your skills to end use. For the first question, examples of soft skills are communication. Is, is this how you want me to answer them? Like communication skills? Yes, please. Yes, please. Because some people <laughs> might assume soft skills like learning how to sew or something. No. So. So examples of soft skills mm -hmm. are communication skills, um, learning and knowing how to communicate effectively for people to understand, retain the information and also respond back to you is a skill that everyone should have. Communication, collaboration skills. Uh, surprisingly, at this part of the world where I'm currently at, they can lay you off if you don't know how to work with people. Like that's that's a formal. Um, <laughs> that's a formal. It's actually very. Good. That's a formal right for them to lay you off if you're unable to work with people and you are unwilling to learn how to work with people. They can lay you off and they are justified by doing that. So collaboration skills is also one important soft skill that I think everyone should have. Problem solving. Uh, please learn how to solve problems. Like even if you might not be the one coming up with the ideas, but knowing how to think through a problem statement and coming up with sustainable solutions for that problem is also an amazing skill that recruiters generally love their candidates to have. Critical thinking is also another one, growth mindset. I know growth mindset might be very funny because people are like, oh, why should I have a growth mindset? Like, I don't like to grow, I don't like to, but one thing I've one thing I've the company it's your own and as though you're trying to build your own company. That's like a very, very important characteristic to have. One thing I've also personally learned is if you don't have a good mindset in your personal life, it might be really hard for you to reflect growth mindset on the job. Yeah, and most of the time, it might not even be that you want to grow the company, but having that mindset also communicates that, you know how the tech space changes every single time, like new technologies are coming up every time. If you don't have that growth mindset, it might be difficult for you to upskill, to learn fast, to actually like put your feet down and say that, oh, this new technology is out. I need to learn it so that I can impact my organization or impact my job role. Which is why, like generally speaking, having a growth mindset in your personal life is super important so that it's easy for you to like bring that mindset on the job and also contribute effectively. So these are like my personal favorites. But I mean, there are others like negotiation skills. Um, no, you've, already, you've already touched base on the, like some of the really important ones. And I think one thing that you can just say is, some of these soft skills are things that are just going to help you to actually pass the interview stages. So before you even go through the door at all, if you don't have any of these soft skills, if you don't show that you have any of these soft skills, then you might not even get it. You might not even pass that interview stage. They just tell you that, okay, thank you very much. We'll get back to you. And that's where it ends, right? Okay, um, so Ms. Ola, I'm back to you. So uh, funny how you've answered like some of the questions that I have, like all of the questions that I have, you actually answered all of them in the first question. But now I have another one. Now, are there any legal or regulatory aspects you think organizations should be aware of when it comes to hiring international talents? 
you know, both in Nigeria and abroad. And I'm going to just give a little bit of context before I let you speak. So now when it comes to like legal and regulatory in terms of, you know, organizations that want to hire from Nigeria, for example, now the talent has gone all the way to finally get the job. So do they just start work like that? Are there any legal um, aspects that they need to cover? Is there anything in terms of compliance that you need to cover? Can a Nigerian just say, oh yes, I work with this company, so I'm going to help them hire from Philippines or I'm going to help them hire from India, like just pick somebody and then start the work. So how does it work? What are the legal and compliance issues that they need to take care of before the employee actually starts working with them? All right, <laughs> fantastic question. Um, so I believe, you know, every organization wants to function as a compliance entity, right? And for anyone, you know, listening in on us and they have interest or they have their eye on one or two Nigerian talents, I would say that I understand that the nature of, um, you know, most of these um, tech employments are contractual. And they are on a rollover basis, meaning that sometimes you just have a one or two year contract that's subject to renewal, depending on your performance with that organization. And oftentimes at the negotiation stage, you pretty much just negotiate your gross salaries and you are expected to take care of your statutories by yourself, right? And I'm not sure that that's like the best approach because um, taking Nigeria as an example, I think we have a robust statutory framework right, speaking to things around our uh, taxes, pay as you earn, our uh, pensions, where you have the 8%, you know, um, employer remittances and 10% employee, there's the NHF and the NSITF, right, all these things were curated for a particular purpose, and I think that employ, I mean, companies should take special interest in understanding the country-specific labor laws, right, so that they can protect their employees' rights. I feel that, yes, you're paying these employees, but I mean, there still comes a point in time where certain things are needed to do certain things. And at the end of the day, it's still going to come back and affect these employees on a personal level. So for instance, it's sort of hard for you to file your taxes if you are just an individual. You don't, you, you know, you don't really understand how taxes work. You don't even understand the computation. You don't know, you know, the right offices to go to and things like that, right? So that's why, I mean, there are also things ar around learning, um, around understanding the, the what's obtainable in terms of benefits, right? Speaking to things like, you know, what does the termination notice, um, termination says, what does the employment law in that state say about payments of notice in lieu? even things as little as public holidays, right? I understand that Nigeria has like one of the most public holidays in the world in comparison with other organizations. <laughs> Sorry. Not as yeah, so I mean, you need to understand these benefits because, you know, these are things that employee expect to enjoy regardless of if they are working with the organization, they expect it to be considerate with, you know, the nuances of their host countries, right? And that's why I always say that I think um, it's highly recommendable for organizations to sort after, you know, companies that provide employee employment as a service functions, such as, you know, the native teams to put them on the right track when it comes to, right. you know, being any fresh hires. Yeah, so um, those are my observations thank you thank you very much for that so i'm just going to layer on a bit on what you just said in terms of you know this legal and compliance issues so um a while back i actually um before i started working with native teams i actually got you know a job with an organization that wasn't in nigeria and they didn't really care much about anything but you know can you receive your money in foreign currency from us and at the time, I wasn't aware of any of these things. I think I wasn't aware of, you know, the fact that I have to pay taxes. I'm sure a lot of you know now that if you want to apply for Form A, 
you actually have to have like your tax clearance certificate. And beyond that, like there are so, so many other things that you need to have. It's not just like the Form A issue, like so many things that you need to do. It's not just about receiving payments, maybe as a freelancer or as a remote worker working for an organization. To you, it might be a case of, you know, Nobody is coming to check me or nobody is saying anything. Let me just keep receiving my free money. But there's a reason why those laws are in place. There's a reason why you have to follow due process. And it becomes very, very tedious when you now get to a point where you now have to start running around to ensure that you have all of these things when you could have simply sorted it out in the first place. So yes, definitely. If you're trying to hire in any country, whether Africa or outside Africa, I can assure you Native Teams is, you know, your go-to, but that's not the conversation, you know, that we're having here, you know, we're really, really just having like really interesting conversation. And I'm sure you guys are learning as much as I am also learning, right? Um, so I'm going to ask another question. Um, Anoma or Sola, you either one of you can take it. So now it's in relation to some of the things that you guys have said, right? Now, let's say, you know, you hustled and hustled and hustled as a global talent, and you finally get this interview with an international organization. What's, what are the things that you need to do? How do you foster that global mindset? Let's say, you know, how do you respond to the questions in that interview? You know, I know you've touched base on a little bit of this in terms of, you know, having those soft skills, you know, being able to communicate, um, being able to show that you can work with teams. So I just want you to really touch base a little more on, you know, how to actually present yourself during an interview with, you know, international organizations, if you don't mind. Uh, I think Anoma can go first. Okay. Uh, thanks so much for that question, Anima. One of the things that I think I did that made me successful during my interview was the fact that I did a lot of research. <laughs> I did so much research about the organization that <laughs> all my friends, when I was interviewing to join Bloomberg, I gave them questions to ask me anytime they see me. They're just randomly asking me this question and grade me based on how I answer the question from a religious point of view. That's a bit extreme, to be very honest. But one thing that I know that I did was to do my research about the organization. Doing my research also made me find out that there were certain values that I had, that Bloomberg also had, that I could identify with, and I could communicate during my interview. And that showed that when I'd done my in, um, research to the recruiter, Two, that I was actually deeply interested in Bloomberg. Three, I had shared values with Bloomberg and I could give examples and I could share past experience of those shared values that I had with Bloomberg. So one thing that I'd say to anyone that maybe you're interviewing with an international organization or you're about to do your research, please do not go into an interview without doing your research because they can ask you. <laughs> like, I, I do know a friend of mine that he asked uh, what are the core values? No, maybe not core values. Something in relations to that about Bloomberg and they were not able to answer. And it was very saddening because they didn't get the role. I, I'm not saying it's not because, I'm not saying it's not because, I'm not saying they were not able to answer because of that question, but I'm just saying that. Yeah. Maybe that was the thing that threw the recruiter off because that is a random answer you should know if you've done your basic research. If you literally Google Bloomberg, if you see it, that's the first thing you would see. And anyways, that's the first thing you need to do, do your research. Now, the second thing that I'd say that I did was to practice. I practiced to a fault again. I, I did like a couple of extreme <laughs> things that I don't think anyone should do. I practiced to a fault to the extent that I was breathing in and breathing out like interview questions, how to sit while I'm talking, ensuring that my internet was extremely good, doing dry runs again and again and again, just to ensure that my internet was stable and it was good. There was no glitching on my camera. My camera is clean, I looked good. Like all of those things, I mean, human beings are biased, yeah. And most of the time, 
they like what they see at first before they even start asking you the questions. Um, oh. So on the side, those were the things I did. One other thing that I'd say is 1% of growth every day accumulates into something huge. So if you spend 1% of your time every single day um, contributing to your interview process, like your pre-interview process, that's um, researching, practicing, um, doing dry runs, every one of these things. You're not practicing interview questions one week before your interview or even one month before your interview. You've started doing it now. You've researched um, top interview questions HR analysts get and you start practicing. Like every single day, you just answer one question. Tell me what's your day-to-day -day like. Or if they ask you, tell me something about yourself that is not on your application. You already have the answer because you've practiced again and again and again. I don't know if, if this like we help anyone, but I like to think that again, from experience, interviewing with an international organization is a bit different than interviewing with a Nigerian organization. For Nigerian organizations, you have to do things like, I don't know. Uh, I don't think I, I can take my hand. Sorry? But, you know, with like you might get away with some things, but with international organizations, you have to be as intentional as possible, as though I, every I, single interview you might not yeah. talk to them again. So you have to be the best that you can possibly be. Yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I, I totally get your point. Thank you so much for that. Um, so Nisola, how about you? Now I want you to speak to me from the point of view of the people operations person, the HR person that is actually communicating with the talent. Now, what do you expect from this talent? What are the things that set them apart from each other? All right, thank you. I really, really like Anoma's point about, you know, researching the organization. I mean, that point cannot be like overemphasized. So that's, that's going to be my number one point all over again. <laughs> And then second thing I'd like to say is, I think that, you know, potential um, hires should pay very special attention to the job description. It is a real life simulation of the role that you are about to assume, right? So, I mean, in detail, look at the expectations of, you know, the roles and um, look at the experience that you have at hand, the experience that you've gathered from your professional certifications that you've written, your volunteering opportunities like Anoma had you know, earlier alluded to, and see how they play into things and you can come up with real life examples, right? So another thing I want yes. to say is that when you're answering, um, you know, um, questions, at um, international interviews or at um, interviews with international organization, they really like to see, you know, like actual scenarios. So I always say that I think we should embrace the star technique, right? Beyond just giving theoretical question responses to say, oh, you just do this, you know. So it feels like you're just walking through a process. Yeah, but when you use the STAR approach, you are describing the situation, when it took place, how it happened, the circumstances surrounding that situation, what even led to that situation, right? Then you move to like the tasks, where you are explaining the task and what the goal was, and then the action. So what, you know, you provide deep details about the action that you took to actually drive this change and attain this goal in question. And then finally, you know, the results, right? That's what every organization is looking for, results. So it's very important to embrace the use of your star techniques, you know, in answering your um, interview question, in, additional, in addition to um, getting a hang of the expectations of the job description. Um, I think one final thing I'd like to add is the importance of selling your professional strength, right? A lot of us, we always say, oh, yeah, it's nice to be humble as long as you're not overdoing it and yeah. you, you are bragging and coming off as, you know, abrasive, right? But it's important to be able to, that this is where storytelling comes into play, right? Being able to build actual scenarios to say, oh, this was what I did and I can do it again in your organization, 
that's the air that you are giving, right? When you're trying to reflect on your personal strength. So those are, you know, pretty much, you know, some of those things. And in reflecting on your personal strength, I would say it sort of creates an air of likability around you, right? And that's like an additional point for even you. Yeah. Okay, so um, thank you very much for that. Um, so you see that both Anoma and Sunsola were very, very, very like keen on, you know, doing your research about the organization, right? I've had two scenarios in my life before where I did not do my research on the organization. And, you know, I was trying to wing it and then I will get to a point and they're like, okay, what do you think we do? I think it was, there was this organization that asked me that question. And honestly, I said the opposite of what they did. They loved every other thing that I was saying. They loved every other thing that I was saying. But, you know, by the time I said, oh, this is what you guys are doing. Meanwhile, that was not even what they were doing at all in any form or shape. That solidified everything for them. And they were like, you know what? Thank you very much. We'll get back to you. In fact, it was immediately after I made that blunder and they were like we'll get back to you and that was where it ended it was so upsetting because i started asking myself you know how many minutes would it take me to actually do proper research on this company now see that it had actually cost me an opportunity that would have been worth a lot that would have probably taken me somewhere but because i didn't do as much research on the organization and i thought maybe yeah i could bring it and this is something that happens a lot when talents are applying to like a ton of organizations at the same time. So you see people that are trying to apply to, they'll tell you now, apply to 100 jobs, apply to 50 jobs at the same time. At some point, you don't even know which interview you're attending. You just want to keep attending interviews. But the reality of it is that there has to be a form of intentionality with everything that you're doing, right? So there has to be some intentionality that you know that for each interview that you're attending, it's a different energy, it's a different vibe, and you're not just going with the same local champion, <laughs> local champion vibe that you know you probably come in with because you're trying to impress these people. You're trying to tell them that there's a reason why they should hire you, as opposed to whoever it is that is in their own country. Like, why should they not hire someone in their own country or someone in Nigeria that is even in their country? And then you come all the way to hire. What's so special about you, right? Um, so we have literally just five minutes left. And what I would like to do is just ask you guys, if you have any questions for our speakers, I mean, they've said some really, really amazing and insightful things here today. If you have any questions, please drop them in the chat box before I ask them my final question. So uh, my final question is going to be um, pretty straightforward, right? So um, let's just make it the two questions, you know, what websites now, um, I know my, I know you got a job with Bloomberg, but do you have any suggestions on the platforms that, you know, people should position better on? Um, I would say LinkedIn, right? So what platform should they position better on? That's one. And then, you know, any word of advice to upcoming tech talents? So that's just it. So you help me answer that and to Ms. Olaya as well, you know, based on the fact that you are the one even hiring these people. So, you know, what platforms do you find them on? What platforms do you put up the job ads on? So yeah, um, Anoma, you can go first on this one. Uh, thank you for the question. I'd say LinkedIn. I know you already mentioned LinkedIn, but uh, most people do not optimize LinkedIn as they should. LinkedIn optimization is a skill on its own. And anyone that is looking at getting a job should, again, optimize their LinkedIn. Follow people that um, you want to follow their footsteps on LinkedIn. And you just say that all of a sudden, you're seeing like amazing resources and job opportunities on your feed every time you go on the app. So LinkedIn is one. I'd say Twitter. Twitter is over the years, especially the past years, has been has been very has been an amazing platform when it comes to recruiting tech talents. Most tech people are on Twitter, and they used to Twitter compared to LinkedIn. If you check, let's say for example, someone that has so many followers on Twitter, if you check their LinkedIn, you just find out that oh maybe they only posted once or twice. 
But on Twitter, that's where they do most of their talking and sharing of amazing resources. So I'd say Twitter is also a great place. Follow tech, like tech mentors. Um, like I used to tell people that sometimes you don't have to meet someone or talk to someone on a one-on-one basis before they are your mentor. You see that they are doing amazing things on social media and you just follow them. So if you are in, if you're a product designer, for example, follow people that are doing amazing well in that field, you'd find out that most of the time recruiters reach out to them and they're not interested in the job role. So they post it on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Most of the time happens every single time. I'd also say check Upwork. So Upwork. Upwork is an amazing um, platform for freelancers. If you also want to get a full-time job, to be very honest, Upwork is a good platform for for tech talent, Upwork. Uh, So general advices that I'd give anyone upcoming tech talent, I'd say one, be patient with yourself. Um, Social media is a flaw, is a fluke and is most of the time a pigment of one's imagination. Um, we tend to want to compare ourselves every single time we see someone doing amazing well on social media. If someone comes online and they say, oh, they are earning 400% times higher than what they used to earn on, and what they used to earn last year, congratulate them and move on. You don't have to spend so much time comparing yourself with them and asking yourself or doubting your capabilities in the first place. So I'd say be patient with yourself, give yourself grace, as many grace as you can. Your journey is not the same as someone else's journey. Just because someone else is making it doesn't actually mean they are making it. And it's not, it's not your business to be honest, as long as you are putting in your own personal work and you're putting in as many efforts as you can on your personal growth and development. So be patient with yourself, give yourself grace. Do not forget to work on your soft skills. They are so important. And while you're working on your technical skills, do not forget to practice. Practice makes progress, not necessarily perfection. If you practice every day for 1%, it accumulates into something amazing at the end of the day. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sumisa, how's it on your end? She's on mute. I don't know if she's on mute. Um, okay. All right, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, my response would be thank God for social recruiting platforms like LinkedIn, like Indeed, and yeah. even Glassdoor, right? So these are places that you know you can just sign up on and start to get job notifications and job alerts and then you know you can always look through to see what works for you in addition to that when you go on linkedin there are a plethora of communities you can join depending on your interests so if you have interest in product design there are product design communities you can check right using boolean um, search on linkedin Mm -hmm. just go to the search page type the keyword you know in brackets just like brackets and product community, design community, and then you see a lot of recommended options and you can follow them from time to time. They have free courses, free classes, you know, tips, um, job tips and things like that, which you find very resourceful as you go along. Um, In addition to that, Upwork is really good as well. There are also a couple of um, online platforms. There's one we call Working Nomads, there's also flex jobs and last but not the least, creative circle, which is like specially designed for women in tech. So if you are women in tech, I mean, you can definitely take a look at creative circle and just go for it. In terms of word of advice to upcoming tech talents, I would say, yeah, um, <laughs> on the outside, you know, tech is very shiny and cool to be in right i'm not saying that's not the case but on the inside it requires a high level of effort dedication and resilience you have to be open to continuous improvement open to continuously growing and on learning right the space is you know there are so many moving parts and things change very frequently so you need to develop resilience and 
you know, high level of adaptability. So as things are changing, we are adopting the changing changes and you're going with it. So what I'll say is, I mean, brace yourself up and stay ready, right? Start to build this mindset of, okay, I'm, ad I'm adaptable and I can work with changes. And then my second advice is, please, if you are new to tech, try and explore the less saturated career paths, right? Some of these paths that we default to software engineering backend, they have a longer learning curve, right? You spend the first maybe two, three years learning how to be a backend engineer, and then you spend another one year looking for a job. The market is highly saturated. There are other career paths you can explore, like data analytics, data engineering. Cybersecurity is really hot in the market right now. And there's also cloud engineering, right? Because of all these cases of fraud and, you know, um, all these fraud cases that we're listening, we're hearing about in the news, you know, cloud engineering and cybersecurity have really become hot cake and those roles are so hard to fill. So why not just look for resources in that space and they built into it instead of, you know, going after the highly saturated parts. So, I mean, yeah, that's, that's my advice. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well said, well said. Um, thank you guys so much. I just want to really appreciate you for taking out time to join this um, webinar and sharing so much of your knowledge and insights with us. Um, I really, really appreciate it. And I'm sure that everyone who joined this webinar, they learned a lot. They learned a whole lot from you guys. And by the time I'm even sending the recording of the webinar, I'm sure a lot of people are going to try to, you know, just rewatch and, you know, learn more from you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining. Um, on this note, I'm going to be ending the webinar now. So thank you. And we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar so we will have so much more of this every month so just look out stay on the lookout for us 